Okay. Ready to get going here tonight. In the show on the road, as they say. Whoever said that. Okay, hey, welcome. Welcome to uh, the October 17th, 2023 meeting of the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association. Uh, first of all, I'd like to recognize any, uh, who, who have any first time visitors tonight? Okay, yep, that's right, two good people, three people, anybody else that I haven't seen? Anyway, welcome, yeah, you're in a good place if you want to invest in real estate or just want to learn more about real estate, data or investing in real estate, you're in a good, very good place. This is a place, we've been, we are a non-for-profit, uh, run by our own members, we're not a, we don't have any, we're not trying to sell you any real estate, we're not trying to lend money on any real estate. Um, there's plenty of people that would do, we have JM Real Estate Capital over there, will lend you, she will lend you money on your real estate, but uh, not this group. She is one of our supporting vendors, and there's a lot of, a lot of folks that do want to lend money on real estate because they know it's such a good investment. That's why us and on the uh, uh, members, are, are we are investors. Anyway, I um, also want to make a few announcements here about uh, our other activities other than this meeting is always on the third Tuesday of every month except December. Um, and then we also have a, on the second second Tuesday, we have a networking breakfast at the shack in Creek Core. It's about uh, a mile or so down west of 270 on, on Olive. Um, and then um, every Friday, at 11 o'clock, we have a Zoom session. That's a good way to, to uh, network. We call it our haves and wants. Uh, if you're looking for something, uh, either a piece of real estate or some services real estate, we should exchange the information. A lot of good contractors you can find there and say, hey, I'm looking for somebody to pour concrete to replace some, you know, the sidewalk. Uh, somebody, will have, somebody that's on there will have somebody that will recommend. Or you want to have somebody that does air conditioning, I'll recommend Brian up here on the, the table right? <laughs> for heating your heating and air conditioning needs. He takes care of me. Uh, and um, yeah, a good good place to be. And uh, and we have sold some properties there too. People that uh, uh, some of our older members are getting ready to pass on their properties to another another uh, uh, another property manager and landlord. Um, yep, we. We close some of those deals, or we make the contact. We don't close deals up. <laughs> we we put the contacts together. So um, no, that's that's a good place to be. And also um, next month, we'll say okay, we meet every third Tuesday right here in the Oasis room. November one exception is in November. We're uh, in this room. It will be filled with Christmas trees next next on the third Tuesday of next month because it's the Tuesday between thanks uh, right before Thanksgiving and that whole week but from the Saturday before Thanksgiving to the Saturday after Thanksgiving uh, they have the uh, Lula Shrine Festival of Trees in fact I've got a couple of flyers I've left on the uh, the uh, table over there, the registration table if you didn't pick up one if you're interested hey you could go come to our meeting up we're, we're gonna be upstairs on the third floor uh, you go in instead of coming through the door if you parked Best way is park on the lower lot. If you haven't been here before, you know that. Park on the lower lot. But instead of coming in the door right down the hall here, come in the door. There's there's a door to the right. There's two entrances on the back. Go through that door, or it's just down the, the way from the, the restrooms here. But if you go through that door and then immediately to the right, there's an elevator. Go up to the third floor, and we'll have some signs up there you know, just around the corner up to the third floor. And we're going to be in the uh, called the Arab Patrol unit room. So it's another nice site. It's not not this big, but there's plenty of room for all of us to get fit in there. And John's got a good program lined up for us for next month. Anyway, uh, just want to remind you that we'll have another note, notice of the change in location for uh, in the in our newsletter. We'll get it on our website too, uh, uh, probably next week. Anyway, um, also I did mention we we're uh, we are non for profit and we're run by our own members and because we are that we we do elect our members we elect our officers for the for uh, the following year, every year in in november we have an election but we do the uh, uh nominations this month in uh, um this is october so uh and i got uh, i'm gonna ask ann bearden to come up and uh announce
announce the uh, the nominations for 2024. Thanks, Lauren. Well, my name is Ann Bearden, and, uh, the chair of the nominating committee. I've been a member of this great organization for 20 plus years. So for all of you um, first timers out there, I encourage you to join and it would be very beneficial to you. So uh, the nominating committee has the responsibility of receiving nominations, confirming the witness willingness of those nominees to serve and validating the qualification of those nominees according to the bylaws of our organization. The board of directors and the qualification of these individuals that shall be elected by the members of the St. Louis Real Estate Investors Association are as follows. The office of president must be a current member a board member, a general member for three years, and an active real estate investor. The Office of Vice President, Treasurer, Secretary, and Membership Chairman must be a general member for two years and an active real estate investor. Three general directors must be general members for two years and an active real estate investor. An active real estate investor is one who owns real estate ex excluding their principal residence for the purpose of rental or resale. Those individuals that have been nominated or have expressed a willingness to serve on the board for the year 2024 are as follows. For the office of president, that's Lord. Okay, Allender. And for the Office of Vice President, it's Amber Gray. For the Office of Secretary, it's Laura Jemison. For the Office of Treasurer, it's Jim Choke. For the Membership Chairman, Laura Lee. And the three nominees for General Directors are John Lee for President Director. Jean Whalen and Kristen Lehman, Lumen. Okay, so at this time, the nominating committee would be would like to call for nominations for the floor. Yes, no one. Okay. So hearing no additional nominations, I will entertain a motion to close the nominations. Make motion. Okay, do I have a second? It has been moved and seconded that the nominations be closed. All that in favor says yes, and if you oppose, say no. Okay, now let's have it. The motion is carried through. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Okay, we're going to uh, move on to our, uh, before we get, a, get over to our main, main speaker here, do a have someone session right here, kind of similar to what we do on on, uh, on Fridays. So anybody have anything real estate related that uh, you want to bring uh, bring to the crowd here? We have any wholesalers that have got, got a property looking to assign to somebody? Um, David. Okay, here, let me. I don't have anything to sell or anything. Just want to give a report. This is really cool. A lot of people know me, and so if you meet me, and, hi, my name's David. I rehab five to 10 houses a year. All my renovated houses have sold in seven days or less. At list price or higher for 13 years. Cool. Well, we just listed a house Thursday night in St. Charles for two fifty nine nine, and we are now under contract for two eighty two. List of two fifty nine nine under contract for two eighty two. So the market's still doing okay. 
in my opinion. <laughs> yep, St. Charles is a good mark to be in. Anybody else got anything they want to uh, say? Have a service to, uh, I was going to say, I was going to hand over to this guy anyway to talk about his services. Hi, my name is Brian Stanley with Energy Home Team the Heating and Cooling. I am an active investor as well. Um, if you have any uh, questions as far as HVAC, feel free to contact me. Uh, I am also looking for rental properties in North County, uh, rehabs in uh, West County and South County. My number is 314-494-6176 and there are some yellow cards in the wall over there. Hey, thank you, Ryan. Okay, anybody else? Amanda, before I go and forget, why don't you come up and tell the Pfizer service, one of our supporting vendors. Hello, I'm Amanda from JM Real Estate Capital. We do lending for your real estate deals. So we do rehab purchases, uh, rental purchases, rental refinance. Um, the 30 year fixed is a DSCR loan. So we're not looking at your W-2s, your tax returns. We also have a business line of credit. We do ground up construction. So um, for those of you that are on Zoom, the best way to contact me will be to shoot me an email at amanda at jmrecapital.com. And for those of you here in person, raise your hand for a card. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Okay, anybody else have anything or hands at once? If not, oh, you do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, my name is Karen McKitty, and I work with Coldwell Banker Realty, and I am a real estate agent. And I work with investors, and the great thing about withheld listings for investors is we have over 1,500 agents in the Coldwell Banker, and whenever an agent goes to a house that might not be ready to sell, They'll sign a listing agreement and we put it in withheld and only people in our office can see it. And it's a great way for an investor to snatch that up before it goes to the MLS. So if you want to know more and want to get a card from me, I'll be back there. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, um, any others? Last call for heads and wants. Pete, you want to you want to say it? Talk about your service. Sure. Why not? Get an opportunity. Hi, I'm uh, Pete Clarmer. I'm with BPG Inspections. Um, I have done investments. I've done hard money lending, but primarily I am a home inspector. So if anybody has need or use of a home inspection, uh, either residential or commercial, I'm happy to help out. I do a lot of work with investors. Uh, for investment properties, I do two types of inspections. I do a full inspection. If it's a higher dollar property where you're going to do a negotiation and you need a full report, uh, it goes through the company BPG and you get the full report and everything. If it's a property where it's just a rehab type property where you know you're going to do a gut rehab, but you want to know if it's structurally sound, you know, roof, foundation, HVAC, et cetera, I can go through and do a walk and talk where I don't do any kind of report, nothing on paper, but I basically do the same full inspection, but I just walk with you and tell you what I find. You can take any notes or pictures you want. It's a lot less expensive. So if I can be of any assistance to anybody, uh, yes. Was that? Commercial property, anything that's over four units, so five unit or more residential is commercial. Um, anything that's a school, a church, a retail center, factories, uh, yeah, office buildings, um, you know, multi-unit, I've done, you know, uh, complexes up to 350 units, 
So yeah, I do commercial. Now I do residential in Missouri. I do commercial in both Missouri and Illinois. So if I can be of any help for anybody with a card, please uh, let me know. Okay, thank you, Pete. All right. Well, without further ado, um, glad to have, we got uh, Roger Wallach, the local attorney with us tonight. He's a member of our group. Uh, he's spoken with us many times. Uh, I've heard him several times, and I'm glad, I'm glad he was uh, agreed to come back tonight. He's going to uh, cover some of our some of the uh, entities you can structure your business in. If you're just getting started, it's a good good way to know you can start out on, on the right foot, uh, structuring your entity to your business in. He's also going to share with us some of the the uh, uh, common uh, mistakes that landlords make and how to avoid them. So we, that is worth a lot. If you can, there's a lot of pitfalls in real estate. You can if you don't. Uh, get yourself educated and uh, stay on the right side of the legal system. So Roger's going to help us out on both of those things tonight. Roger Wallach. Giving this take this one. And wait, now it's no this one. So let's switch it out. Yeah. Okay. So do I need to get really close? No, I guess not. It's too sensitive, right? All right. So hi, I'm Roger Wallach. I am a real estate attorney. I do real estate business law and litigation arising out of real estate and business law. Um, we do do, and uh, I have a firm, Wallach and Associates, and I have a few lawyers working for me, so it's not just a sole practitioner situation, and it was for some years, but uh, if anything, I'm growing at this stage, which is interesting, I didn't totally expect that. But, um, so we're, we're growing in what we can handle, we can handle trusts and estates now, and we can also and a wider range of litigation, um, I'd say. And, but the core is still business transactions, both real estate and to some degree, just ordinary, like buying and selling of a business and things like that. So we're a business law firm primarily. Um, today, I guess I, 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 what I planned on is really focusing down on what I think is the structure that you need really in the beginning and for many people kind of all you'll ever need um i have you probably many of you have met or and some of you know well a man named dan bryan dan bryan is a great guy dan bryan has the mind of a lawyer although he never went to law school he's quite a phenomenal guy he's also a general contractor in both electrical and plumbing he recommends a lot and loves to talk about trusts. I will make a passing reference to trusts in what I think is the right place, but trusts, and I help him teach that class sometimes. And so if you're ready for that, it's a great, it can be a great strategy, but it's definitely more complex than you need at the beginning. As I, and as I'm saying, you, for, many of, for many of you, you don't ever really need to use a trust. What I'm basically going to be recommending, and I'm going to get into the details quite a bit here, is a limited liability company. Now, most of you have heard of it, I'm sure, an LLC. And that structure in Missouri is simple, straightforward, and can do, I think, pretty much everything that you, that you need. But let's get into why and, and kind of how I, why I think so to go through some of these slides and we'll see more about it. But how many people already have an LLC? I should probably, oh, well, maybe I, maybe I should, we should all just go home. Then. <laughs> Me, kind of short. I guess I hopefully then will, but that tells me something. I'll emphasize some things then that might have been a little deeper than I would have gone into. So, but I may know a couple of tricks that you might find helpful. So here. 
What are the original forms of doing business? Well, of course, you can do businesses yourself. It's still allowed. People don't tend to do it so much, but you can in sole proprietorship, right? That's the technical name. You can do business as yourself and your spouse. You can even adopt a business name. And there's a way to file that in Missouri. You've probably all heard of it. It's just a DBA, a doing business as. What's the limitation of that? Anyone want to tell me what they already know? That why is that? What's the yeah? I mean, you can do that, but what's the basic? What's the big thought that comes to mind if that's all you do is is work for your do it yourself or do it as a DBA? Does anyone want to volunteer? No yeah. protection. No protection from from what though? Right. Well, from lawsuit, basically that you're on the hook, you own that property personally. So anything that goes wrong, right, is going to come back on your head. Somebody has a trip and fall. You um, something happens with the property, and you know, or you can't sell the property. I mean, everything is on you um, financially. So that's how do you avoid that? Well. People have tried other, obviously you can have partners. Partners do spread the risk, some, right? What's the problem with partnerships though? It's the same problem, which is that you do have one other, you have a partner now, or two or three or whatever. So that spreads the risk some. However, you're all personally liable for the debts of the partnership. And furthermore, you now have to watch out what that partner is doing because if that partner does something that binds the whole partnership or it can we're not here to get that deep as to when would it bind the partnership and when wouldn't we could go forever on just something that 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 narrow but that's a reason not to oh how did that um that's a reason not to simply use a partnership um Corporations, you could use a corporation, but corporations have complexities that you don't need. And you have to do an annual report every year to the state of Missouri, which, a little preview, which you don't have to do for, LL, for limited liability companies. So you have an annual report, but more important, you have multiple layers of tax. Most of you probably know some of this, right? And other issues that make a corporation kind of complicated, needlessly complicated for holding real estate, not to mention that you're going to get taxed at the level of the corporation and then taxed again when you take dividends out. So distributions from a corporation are also taxable. Now trusts, here's where I put, I did put it in here. Trusts are a very old form. Dan loves to point that out. Trusts are, as are corporations, both of those have been around in the Western world well before there were corporations in Europe before America was before the Europeans came here. Um, so, I mean, those two forms, corporations and trusts, are very old. But trusts were not designed as a, to protect you against liability. They are very private because there's no public filing for a trust. A trust is a, created by a private contract between you, the trustee, and the beneficiary. That's one thing that Dan loves about them. But, um, and don't, I'll tell you what, don't ask me about QST twists unless you're really interested in trust. So I can talk afterward about that. But trust, so they can be useful, but they're complex to set up and they do not, in and of themselves, protect you from liability. The trustee can be liable. The beneficiary could end up being liable under, again, under lots of different scenarios that we won't dig that deep. However, Limited liability companies essentially solve all those problems. Um, they well, what oh, what what do they have in common with corporations? I mean, corporations were good in their day when that was all the only choice you really had. So, what does a corporation? What does it do for you that's positive? Everyone, it's the same answer you gave me before. It does protect you, the shareholders of the corporation, from personal liability for things that the corporation does including if the corporation does something wrong or there's a trip and fall on its property that the corporation owns. Well, that would protect the shareholders from being personally liable for the debts, but there's so much other complexities to the corporation 
And guess what? A limited liability company gives you the same protection as a corporation. It's, it's now well established that the protection that a limited liability company gives you is identical to the protection that a corporation gives you. Um, what's interesting is that it was it limited liability companies are relatively new in the United States. They the first ones, the first state to pass a statute that created the idea of a limited liability company was in 1995 or 96, and it was Wyoming. I don't know why, but other states soon followed. But in the beginning, people were a little nervous to use it because they didn't know would courts. The idea was that they should be the same protection as a corporation, but at first, you know, it was considered a little risky to try it because until it was tested a few times in courts, and that's how the law is in a lot of things, right? You've all either heard of that or some of you have experienced it, that something new in the law is not always a good thing because you don't know which way it's gonna go. The law works a lot by precedence, which means if it's been done before, now we know what, what's gonna happen in that kind of case. So LLCs took about a decade, I would say, before they became widespread. So by the mid 2000s, it was becoming like a just a given that they're fine. I thought it was fun to put in the fact that they are older in Germany, Spain and France. I just picked those three because they're like the most familiar European countries, I think, in terms of if you're an American. And there was always you know, when you see AG after a company's name, like Siemens, or that's that's the same as you know Inc. in English. If you see, oops, I'm hitting the buttons. Here. If you see uh, that other thing though, GmbH, right? That's that's essentially a limited liability company, um, and those have been around at least a hundred years. Same with in Spain and. Latin America and in France. So the, you know, Romance languages, Latin languages, it's similar. So you'll, you'll see SA and SA in either French or Spanish is the equivalent of Inc. It's limited, Societad Limitada is, implies limited liability. The other one, um, Societad Anonima, excuse me, I got it backwards, is the one that's equivalent to Inc. And then the SRL or SARL is equivalent to a limited liability company. Just a little fun footnote. But um, my point was that they were they were well established in Europe, and for a long time, lawyers, American lawyers, would look at across the across the pond, as they say, and be very jealous of the fact that this existed over there because people were trying to do similar things, and they had all kinds of gimmicks to try to make it work. But anyway, now those gimmicks of kind of disappeared into history and we have limited liability companies. So let's get let's get practical. Um, there I put limited liability, no LLC, no liability for the LLC owners. Um, and the slide is, as you all can see, is chief features. That is the, to me the chief feature. That's what you want. That's why you want an LLC. However, there are other things that are good about it. Privacy. We're going to emphasize something here that I want to teach, which is if you do, if you set up the LLC correctly, it can give you just as much privacy as a trust, as that whole trust system. It's true the filing is public, but I'm going to go into you know slide or two later how you do it so that there is no issue about the world, all the world knowing that you're really the owner of that LLC. Uh, so there's a way to do it, but there's also a way to goof it up where the whole world will know. And it's very hard to erase, right? Because we all know once something's on the internet, you can change it, but that old, it still can be found, right? So you don't want to get it wrong in the first place. You want to do it right. But if you do it right, it's just as private. So I'm going to go into more detail on that in a minute. Beneficial tax treatment, right? What's better about the LLC than the corporation as far as tax treatment? Who here, anyone know? Or has it, uh, is it, um, to a lot of you, it's obvious, I'm sure. As a corporation. You could solve the, yeah, you, well, you're hinting at what I'm talking about and then solving it without saying what the problem is. <laughs> yeah, so it's obviously the, 
the two layers of tax I mentioned earlier in the corporation and in limited liability company is a pass through entity, meaning it can make as much or as little money as it wants. It doesn't pay any tax directly. Now it does have to distribute when you're all said and done. In other words, you take the expenses and net them against what you made and all the other things you can do to lower your taxes, to lower the appearances of income or the reality of income. But in the end, you get a K-1, you get a form that says, okay, now you're the owner of this, you get this money and you pay taxes on it, but at least you didn't have to pay taxes on it at the level of the company. You just have to pay ordinary taxes on it at the level of your personal, your own income. Um, Escape will do it. Yeah, 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 thanks. Perfect. They did. Now, flexibility, ease of use compared to a corporation. Again, there's no annual report. There's, there's no. That's, a, and that's very unusual. Um, in the sense that even in Illinois, there's LLCs in other states. But as far as I know, I've not run into a state except Missouri that doesn't require something to be filed every year. Missouri is unique in my experience. I haven't tried it in all 50 states, but I've tried it in, in multiple states. And as far as I know, you have to keep filing something once a year, at least. Um, and, but not here. You do it once and you, it's good for life. Um, easy and inexpensive to set up. It is relatively easy to set up and it's relatively inexpensive. In Illinois, it costs you $500. In Missouri, it costs you $50. I'd say that's a pretty big difference. Not only that, but in Illinois, you pay something. I don't think it's 500 every year. Maybe it is. It's, anyway, it's a lot every year. And in Missouri, you've won and done. So you'd really, I've actually been in as a lawyer in a position of recommending to somebody living in a different state that they form a Missouri FLC because it could be, now there's problems. It doesn't solve everything. Because you probably have to file at a certain point, you might have to file in that other state something to, to recognize the quote foreign, meaning out of state entity. It gets complicated. So, this isn't always that useful to do that. But certainly, while we're here in Missouri, it's a good, it's a pretty good deal we have with the limited liability companies. Um, and they are easy to set up because those of you who've done it, and I'm sure some people in here have done it themselves already, the questions that they go into are not all that complicated. And then you can do it online. Now that's the oral, what's called the Articles of Organization and they exist online. You also need a second document, which I'm coming to, called an operating agreement. That's a little more complicated. There's a little less guidance out there on how to do it. But I'll, and let me come to that because I do have slides on, we're gonna move through that. Um, one thing people do not always know about an LLC, because it definitely is not talked about much, and uh, is, that, is that you can put provisions in your operating agreement that would make the LLC transfer on death, just like a TOD on a bank account or on a car, on a car title. You can build something into your LLC that keeps it out of probate, keeps it from you know, going to court to decide who's the next owner. It can be in the operating agreement and that is enforceable. That's, that will, it will work. So that is a useful, very useful. You certainly can't do that with a corporation. I mean, you can leave your share. I guess you can in a way. You could leave all, if you're the sole owner and you've got all the shares, you can leave the shares. But you can't, yeah, but you no, know, but you can't put transfer on death on the shares, I don't think. I don't know. I'd have to look into that, but it's certainly easy with an LLC. So what do you need to do to set up the LLC? You've got to make sure the name has not already been used. So you, one of the first things, if someone comes to me, a new client, what are the minimum you need to tell me to help set up the LLC if, if the person isn't going to do it themselves? They got to have the exact name because we got to clear it. It's easy to do, but you have to make sure it's available, name is available. 
There are two basic answers to this question about member or manager, which is that it, you want to know whether you're going to make it a member managed LLC or a manager managed LLC. This is the only, probably the most complicated question you'll have to answer, and it's not that complicated. Basically, oops. So I always recommend for most of the, I mean, most of the time that you make it a manager managed LLC. Now, why do I say that? Let's back up one step. The owners of an LLC are not called shareholders the way the owners of a corporation are. What are they called? They're the members, right? So the, you're called a member of an LLC just because you're the one of the owners. Well, you're the sole member, then you're the sole owner. So that's kind of the default. Meaning, in the, when you fill the form out too, if you don't do anything, it, it'll make it'll be member managed and it'll be just members. If you pick managers, you're not forced to name anybody as a manager. You could still just have one member, or let's say there's two of you and you just want to be members. You don't ever have to appoint either one of you as a manager if you decide. Well, I don't know why why we bothered with that. We don't really want that. Just leave it alone and just don't do it. But it's nice to have the choice. Because there's two, there's a couple different things about that that are helpful or can be. One is you can name a manager who's not one of the men, one of the owners, but that manager can do things to run the company. But more important, you can call yourself if you're at least one of the members, but you you're the one who's going to run things. You can also be the manager as well as a member. Sometimes. That can be very useful when talking to tenants. If you own a manager managed LLC and you're, and, but it owns rental property and your tenant is complaining to you about how the, you know, the toilets don't work or this, that, or they never do that. They never this, they never that. And if they see you or they, you can basically say, well, I don't know. I'm just the manager, right? I'll have to ask the owner whether it's okay. You're just a manager. So you can put, if you're clever with it, you can put a layer of negotiation between you and like the buck stops with you. No, it doesn't. It's, I've got to check with the with the members. Never mind, you're the sole member. You know, they don't need to know that. Or, or it could be true, right? Maybe you have other, one or two members that are not besides yourself. Um, here's where we get into the tricky part. The registered agent and the organizer. There's a line in there called organizer. The organizer is a leftover vestige from, I don't know, the 19th century or before. It makes no difference whatsoever under any circumstances who the organizer was. You could put Bozo the Clown as the organizer. It will not matter, okay? Um, so you don't, what, what should you not do then, based on what I just said? No, you should not put yourself, right? Why? I mean, maybe for ego purposes, but now, guess what? The organizer will be visible on the internet for the rest of time. So, and even though you didn't say any, it doesn't say anywhere there that the organizer is the owner, and the organizer is not inherently an owner. The organizer has no particular rights. It's not totally perfectly true, but it might as well be, you know, for everybody's purposes. The organizer has no particular rights, so there's no reason to put yourself as the organizer. But you can bet that people are going to assume or guess that if you're the organizer, you probably likely that you're also the owner. In fact, they may even just assume that that's what that means. So now you're inevitably connected with that company. The registered agent is a little trickier. You must have a registered agent. The registered agent has one actual job that cannot be delegated to anybody else. It doesn't come up a lot, but when it does come up, it's really important. If I'm as a, law, as a lawyer, I need to sue from on behalf of my client, we need to sue somebody's LLC. And we write up the court paper and we file it in court. Then either I have to find a private person or the sheriff of St. Louis of the county can do it also in the county where the LLC is located. But the person who's going to be served with the papers that say, hey, you've been sued, is the registered agent. It must be either an individual, an individual human being, 
sometimes lawyers use individuals or persons. Persons can mean artificial persons like LLCs and corporations as well as people. But the word individual to a lawyer signals, it's like almost a code word. We know that when we say individual, we mean a, a living, breathing human person. And a registered agent, there's only two, two types, individuals or corporations. Now, don't ask me why, but a corporation can be a registered agent, not an LLC, not a partnership, not a trust, none of the, nothing else, an individual human being or an, a corporation. My law firm is a corporation. If I'm helping you with this, why not put my law firm as the registered agent or whoever your attorney is? Because first of all, there's a, who should know first that you've been sued? It wouldn't be a bad idea, right? To have, even if you don't like that lawyer anymore and you wanna to go to a different one, but that lawyer is certainly not gonna risk his license to, and forget to tell you that, hey, you just got sued just today because I got your, I got served as your registered agent. So even if you don't like that lawyer anymore, that lawyer will make sure to find you and at least tell you that much. And then he'll say, he or she will say, well, you want me to represent you? And you could say, no, I got a, I got a better lawyer. <laughs> but um, at least you'll find out. What's the, the big plus of that? You don't appear, the, right? And I don't mind doing it because everyone understands that if Wallach and Associates PC, which stands for what? Does anyone know, by the way? Stands for professional corporation. When you see a PC, it's only going to be like doctors, lawyers, architects, only certain professions in Missouri. This is just the Missouri, a quirk of Missouri law. So a PC is a professional corporation, but I am a type of corporation. That is my well, like an associate's is. So it can be a registered agent. If I a lot of lawyers are just LLCs, they're law firm, I mean. They that that firm cannot be a registered agent. But a, a PC can do it. So that, and now who's all over the internet? Wallach and Associates. Well, I don't mind that because no one's going to come chasing me because they figure out uh, pretty quickly, well, he's just a lawyer. He doesn't own it. He's probably, it's probably his client or her client, right? I mean, whoever the lawyer is. So this is what I meant by if you set up the LLC right, it's just as private as a trust. The trick is do not put mm -hmm. yourself, excuse me, as the organizer or the registered agent. And it's not so great if you did it and then you change it. I mean, I guess I would do that if you did it, but the old one is hard. I mean, it can probably still be found. It's yeah, it's better. I mean, if the current one is, if you change it, it's still worth changing because it's not so easy to find uh, older, older versions, but I think they're there if you really know how to hunt. So that is how you preserve privacy using an LLC is don't put yourself anywhere in there. You don't, uh, when, oh, back up to members and managers. You pick member or manager, but you don't, nothing in the form requires you to say who the first manager or the first members are. You don't put that at that. Now that form is public. I guess I should have said that because I guess it was implied by what I was saying. I just realized I never really said that. We're talking about a form, of course, that gets put on the Secretary of State's website, the Missouri Secretary of State website. So that the answers to all those things you fill out in that form, the articles of organization are visible on the website of the Secretary of State. Likewise, if you want to know something about an LLC that you're dealing with, just go to the Missouri Secretary of State, do a business search and put the name in and you'll see all this, all this information. So that can be useful. And other people who didn't come to this lecture and don't know not to put their names in it. If you want to know who's really running it, a lot of times the people do put their own name, either as registered agent or as organizer. And well, that gives you a pretty good clue of who's either the owner or closely involved, at least in the business of the, of the LLC. Then you get to find financing. So the first question is the bank. You want to open a bank account in the name of the LLC. What is the, what is the bank gonna ask you for? Besides money, you gotta have at least what? 100 bucks, 10 bucks? Yeah, I thought it was 
operating yes, agreement. your operating agreement. So that's the other document that you need to form. And that one is not filed anywhere in public, unlike the first thing we were talking about, which again, I didn't put the name, but it's called the art. The first thing is the articles of organization. And the second thing is an operating agreement. The bank wants to see your operating agreement. They probably have a form. If you don't have one, they have a form on it that they tear off of. I think they tear off a legal pad and make you fill it out. It's got nothing in there very good to protect you. It, but it will do if all you want to do is open the bank account. But it's not recommended because there are going to be all kinds of things that should be in there that, that are not in there. Um, the operating agreement is, other than showing it to your bank, because they're going to insist, but you do not have to show that to anyone else. That goes in a drawer and you, no one needs to see that. So yeah, that's going to have a lot of interesting information in it, but that's not to be shown to, to uh, third parties. Um, there's basically two levels of operating agreement, which is the simplified one, which I can create, particularly if you're a, if you're a single person LLC, or it's a, it's a, you know, spouses are owning it. Um, it can be kept very simple, two, three pages. An operating agreement though can also, and probably should, if there's three, let's say there's three partners, but they're not, you know, they're not spouses and they're not, they're, they're really three different people in business together or more. If there's three or more, then the operating agreement also becomes the place to put certain things like what you might otherwise, some of you may have heard of a buy-sell agreement. In other words, an agreement among the owners, well, what happens if we want to break this business up? What happens if one of us wants to leave? How do we value, the, does that person just have to leave and abandon their interest? They have no, they get nothing for it? None of you, right? So you, that's not a good answer, most likely, right? So how do you set that up is in the operating agreement. Well, that kind of operating agreement, which functions as a kind of buy-sell agreement too, also, um, and is going is there forever to protect the, the partners. Well, I'll call them partners loosely because they're not partners in a partnership, but using the ordinary English meaning of the word partners, meaning you're in business together. The partners, because what are they called really? They're members, right? But the partners, when you're still friends, Usually that's the good time to decide how you're going to divide things up. Then if, right, because I, my favorite thing to say to when I'm representing people trying to start a multi-person LLC, three or more people, I say, sure, this is great. And everybody's going out to make the most money we can and every, that's great. And I'm sure that someday, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I don't, you're all going to wake up on that same day and you're going to say, you know what? Today's the day, it's time to get out of the business. Uh, and you're all three gonna have that same thought on the same day, right? No, people get divorced. People, people have, get into financial trouble and need to get out of, you know, sell their interests out and or people move away. I mean, there's a million reasons that come up in life, right? And so you have to have, and that's not the time to start negotiating. When that's that's happening, that's not when you want to start negotiating how this is going to work. If you have built in a mechanism ahead of time, when you were still all still friends, and the key is what? Why do I say when you're all still friends? Why is that important? What's important about it? I mean, you all can imagine it, but I'll say it expressly. It's because you don't know who you are in the story. You don't know if you're the one who's trying to leave or you'll be one of the ones who's trying to stay. So you're much more likely to make a fair because you don't, you might be the one leaving or you might not. And so you're gonna, the th three or more of you are gonna work harder to create a mechanism that you now, at least, at least for now, you think is the best and fairest way to divide things up if you have to. It does work, I've seen it work. This talk wasn't, intended to go deep into the different kind of mechanisms that there are to do that. There are several. We can, I mean, that's the kind of thing you come to see me for. But there are some interesting, I don't like talking afterward, maybe if anyone wants to go deeper. But there are definitely ways to set that up. 
and that setup goes into the operating agreement. That's where it's got to be to be binding on everybody, on the members. That kind of operating agreement, <clears throat> this is a little plug for, well, you'll see, you'll see in a second. That's the kind of operating agreement that takes a while to do. So like Roger, is our operating agreement done yet? <laughs> in other words, that you can't just do that on the back of a napkin. You, it's going to require layers of negotiation. You do a draft, you circulate it with the, among the members who then have questions and then you have to answer, you know, and you, it's an adjustment bit by bit until you get to a good document. That takes time. Time translates into money for, you know, when you're hiring a lawyer. So I'm not, that's, I do want to put in your thought. That's the one place where if you have a multi-person LLC, but it's not unique to LLCs, right? It would be the same problem in uh, just a plain partnership or just a, um, even in a corporation. You, these issues are not unique to the LLC. They're, what they're unique to is the fact that you've got multiple interests. In fact, in the corporate world, which was much older, remember I said for years, like all through the 20th century until the very end of the 20th century, corporations were the way to go. Well, that's, that's where the term buy-sell agreement came from because the shareholder agreement didn't usually have any of that in it. You needed a separate agreement, which captured the same thing as I was just discussing. <clears throat> so lawyers have experience with those same issues, but they weren't called, they weren't inside the operating agreement. Instead, they were in a separate document generally was called a buy-sell agreement. I put some of the other things in there that have to do with financing because, of course, we all love our LLC. Well, wait, let me stop a second because I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going into a new area. Was that part clear? Okay, about, all right, about the setup and about the operating agreement versus the articles of organization. Okay, the rest of these are all just some thoughts in a sense. One good thing about the LLC is some people I know run into a limit where they personally, they, just, they started out buying things personally and the bank suddenly won't lend them any more money. Why? Because they have four in their name. I don't know if it's still four, but for a long time you hit four and then they wouldn't lend you anymore. Just some kind of guideline that the banks follow. The LLC usually gets around that. It's a business entity. Certainly, if, if nothing else, it gives you four more <laughs> under a different name. But that's one nice trick. Whose credit? Can you get the bank to fund the L finance the LLC without uh, making you liable? Well, now, that would be a dream. That's very unusual in the beginning, right? Because if you have no business history and your LLC has no business history, they probably won't, well, they won't just finance the LLC because they know that the LLC it is only liable for the assets that it owns, whereas the bank probably wants you on the on the on any lending on any lending instrument. So that's why I said who's oh, this thing keeps doing that. Am I doing that? Yeah, okay. So the so that's where I put personal guarantee. How does the bank get around the fact that it's a limited liability company? The answer is usually when you're a beginner, they're going to make you, sure, they'll lend money to the LLC, but they're going to make you sign a personal guarantee, which is means you're just as liable, but that's just to the bank. You still have the protection of the LLC in terms of everyone else, but you'll probably have to sign a personal guarantee in the beginning. There could come a point where you have so much business and so much history in the LLC that they actually will finance the LLC without your personal guarantee, but that takes, you have to have built up a reputation, I would say. Um, property as collateral is there to remind me of a story, but I won't, it's probably too deep a story for the game for tonight. But let's just say that if you already owned a bunch of rentals, but you needed to use them as collateral, because suddenly you're going to buy your first apartment building, let's say. You're going up now a step. You need to borrow much more and you need more collateral than you've, than you've needed before because you're buying now a million dollar property. You can at least, at least the LLCs are fairly easy to get them to pledge whatever rental property they own to support your next purchase. And that, that's allowed. Is Dan here? No, he didn't come. Okay, good. Maybe he's listening. But, Dan won't like me saying this, but that's much harder to do in, with if everything is owned in trusts. 
If everything's owned in trust, that becomes a headache. It can be done, but it is much more of a headache. So it's much easier to get your LLC property sort of to muster them, to kind of pledge them if that's where you want to go. I'm not saying you have to, but if that's going to help you borrow the bigger amount of money to buy your first apartment complex, it's more likely you'll be able to make that happen. Um, so it's just more nimble. It's just more nimble than other forms of business. Now, oh, so let me, now, that's really, in terms of structure, I think I've tried to sell you a bit on LLCs and how they work and how simple they are. Let's look at, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a turn here and talk about something that is related in my mind to business structure, but it, it's a little bit of a diversion, but I think you'll see why I wanna do it. Everyone good now though, because I am taking a slight turn. Everyone clear, any questions at this point? Oh, well, sure. Uh, our banker said that we should, because we were several different LLCs, that we should just have one bank account that all the LLCs can just, you know, pull the money and stuff. Well, because that would reduce fraud because we'd be exposed less to fraud. However, if all the LLCs go to the same bank account, would that increase our liability? Well, I would sure think that any creditor of any one of the LLCs could, if they got a judgment, went ahead and got a judgment, they become a, they, they could reach that money and they could probably reach all of it. I don't think you can draw any, any line if you're pooling your money under the, now is the account really owned from the bank's point of view by all the different LLCs collectively? No. Well, who owns it then? Oh. I think so. I mean, right. yeah. I mean, I, I've look when people are new. I've let I've suggested look. Let's not go. Don't get. Yeah. You know, don't let. Don't let perfection be the enemy of good enough. Okay. Better than owning. Let's say someone comes to me they, and this has happened. They have two or three properties. Now they're looking to grow more, but they own the two or three in their own name. Put the two or three in one LLC. If, it, if, if it's all too much for you, just put them in, at least put the three of them in one LLC. It's better than, than your personal one. Yeah, sure, the uh, slip and fall in one probably does open up not just the one property, but the other two to possibly being liable, but it's better than you personally. So start simple with one LLC, if nothing else. But yes, eventually we can go there, I recommend a whole a certain strategy with how many LLCs, and I think at the end of the show, slides I get to that about how many. But yeah, go ahead. What's the question? That's a good question. No, that's a very fair question. Um, you need to pay attention because the lawyer. If, if, what if they forget to? Let's say the lawyer doesn't even think about the fact that she or he is a is your registered agent or their firm is yeah i mean eventually um it may get uh, it would and that would actually be a problem if the, i'm thinking on, on my feet here because i didn't come think i didn't think ahead of that question that's a very good question you know i might want to talk to you afterward but basically you want to be aware of whether your lawyer is doing that you do not want your llc to sort of i mean you don't you do not want your registered agent if it's an entity like I said, if you remember, it can either be an individual or a corporation. If that corporation is going out of business, you do need to pay attention to that because your LLC could get dissolved. It's actually pretty bad if it's, if it's uncovered that your registered agent doesn't exist anymore. Same with an individual who died, by the way. It's the same. It's a similar problem. You can't just sit there and let that stand. That gets found out, then the then the LLC could get dissolved and then you're looking at the liability yourself. So you do not want to let it sit there if the, if the registered agent either dies because they were an individual or go out of business. That's a good point. And I haven't often think more about uh, how to protect about that, but that's a good point. And it is concerning. Oh, it's easy to fix. It's really easy to fix if you know to fix it, <laughs> but you, don't want to fix it after the lawsuit comes, right? You want to fix it beforehand. Oh, it's easy. It's $10 and, and, and the form. Yeah, it's easy to fix. 
Sure. Um, make your, if you don't know who to do, you know, if you, oh my God, I got to get somebody. If you have to put yourself in there, but don't let your company get dissolved. Because it would, again, nothing will happen as long as they don't find out, but they can find out. It's, again, too many stories. Um, Well, so, right. So I, so, so there are companies that people may have heard of, I think CSC and CRC, there's, there's corporations that have take advantage of people in my mind and charge something like $350 a year or more to just be the registered agent. And that's a pain in the butt that that exists. I do charge a small amount because of just the vigilance I need to have. So I charge my, I do charge, I charge much less, but I do charge for it. Um, I used to charge like almost nothing and I decided I, you know, because there have been some times where it's a headache, you get served and you, oh, is the headache for, for me as the attorney is what, what would you guess? The client has moved and never told me or the client, the, the, so I'm the registered agent and I'm responsible to let the person know and I have no idea how to find them. That's a pain. It's a risk I take, but and then I certainly have to go through whatever motions I need to go through in order to find them. So I do charge, I charge 150 a year. Not, so whatever that works out to be, like 10 bucks a month or a little more. So I guess, I, yeah, twelve fifty, I guess. So yeah, I do, I, I decided I do have to charge at least something. Um, but that's what I charge. But yes, that's a factor. I mean, right. I, you might find someone who will do it for free. And of course, you might find an individual. I mean, as a lawyer, some lawyers might do it individually and not charge for it. I just rather use my co my company uh, since I can, since I'm a PC. All right. Anything else before I go to the deeds? Oh, sure. Okay. Sure, you can use any individual. Oh, okay. uh, well, well, that's your up to your opinion. What do you think? Do you have the same last name? Yeah, so I mean, that's just your own personal view of the world. I mean, sure, I mean, it connects you somewhat, but not everyone's going to know that that's your mother, but I mean. But yeah, I mean, the fact that she works for a law firm is neither here nor there. The individual, I should make it clear, does have to live, has to give their address and has to be a Missouri address. Same with the law firm. I mean, you have to be a Missouri, you have to have a Missouri address as the registered agent, individual or, or corporation. But she does, I assume. Yeah, so you could do that. It's free, I get it. But, and she works in a law firm, so at least if she gets served with the paper, she can say, uh-oh, can you tell me what to do with this? Yeah, I mean, I get it, it's fine, but they might eventually connect you. It's just a question for you to decide. Um, anything else? Okay, hold on, hold on, get the mic for me. Uh, what about insurance problems? Uh, is, uh, I've heard that if you have a contractor work for you and they don't have workman's comp, that your liability doesn't cover it? Is that Mike? That's me. Oh. Um, workers' comp is a good, is a, is a tricky area. Um, are you, if you're using your LLC to do construction, you probably need to obey like all the rules of what contractors and construction, I mean, it's a, it's a world unto itself. The answer is I'm sure you do need workers' comp if you're, if you're a, using your LLC to build houses uh, and you've got workers working for you. Um, so sure though, the LLC would be the one liable for if you did it wrong or you didn't have workers' comp. If you don't have workers' comp, the LLC is responsible, but, and there are penalties for not having workers' comp, which, I mean, there are conditions under which they might be able to penetrate the LLC. They would certainly try. If you break the law, basically, let's say this as a general point without getting again into a whole nother lecture. If you use the LLC to actually flout the law, then there are chances that 
that could result in them being able to, someone suing you because of what you did, to be able to break through that protection because you broke the law and, and you shouldn't have been allowed to do that. So I, is that automatic? No, it's not. But is that a danger? Yes, if you're doing stuff that's incorrect. And one thing that would be pretty incorrect is not having workers comp on construction sites. So you, so, but yes, I think, but I, is that the question or maybe I'm, No, it does. Your insurance might not, but I mean, it would seem like he maybe he couldn't sue. He could try. Look, that's the kind of thing where people try. He might try to sue you. He'd include you and the. If I were his lawyer, I'd put you and the LLC as defendants in the lawsuit. If I'm now, if I'm your, you and your LLC, if I'm your lawyer, I'm going to try to just get the case against you personally dismissed because oh, he was working for the LLC. If you want to make that clear, have him. Have a little contract in the name of the LLC that you create with him. That would be much, much better in terms of winning that point that he doesn't work for me personally, he works for the LLC. So I would definitely look at that. I would, I would, I would have an agreement with him. Is it perfect? Would it, you know, if you nothing's perfect, nothing, you know, everything is with the law, as you any of you who've worked with attorneys. Have probably what's what's their favorite and what's I know it's my favorite answer. What's 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 an attorney's favorite answer to every question or the first thing they'll say? It depends. It depends. Yeah. Right. And maybe you're going to cover this later, but will you still be able to have privacy with the LLC with the Corporate Transparency Act that's coming in? Well, I haven't studied the act, so I can't really answer it. Um, so, I, I, so having been asked that question, I will go home and do my homework. But what um, I would say, though, initially, is I don't see how, I mean, corporate transparency doesn't mean that you, I don't know where it shows, in other words, I don't know what the act requires in terms of what you have to show and where. I mean. I only just found out about it today, so okay. it, it says that it's going to affect LLCs. I wasn't sure if it was also going to affect Well, um, that's the kind of thing I'll be investigating, but um, I don't know right now. Um, it would surprise me that it, that would be a huge change and it would surprise me, but uh, I'll look I'll look at it. Is it a Missouri Act as far as you know, or you think it's federal? Yeah, it's federal. Federal. Hey, Lloyd. Yeah. David probably knows about it. He keeps up with uh, yeah, yeah. old laws. Right. Yeah, you remember five years ago when that such that uh, Trump 2018 tax law was passed, right? Um, it, Lloyd didn't bring in an accountant to talk to you guys about it. He brought me in because I'm a real estate investor, so I want to know these things and what's happening. And I use it. So yeah, the just um, you know, Roger, the that's CTA. It's, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing. There is no more privacy, even in a trust, Roger. Okay, even in a trust, all the way down to the beneficiary, they get it all. Okay, now here's the deal, though: it's all going to go to someplace really safe at the government, where no one will be able to get to the data. Okay, so we should all feel very safe about that. Yeah, right. But yeah, LLCs, corporations. I don't care how many things you string with a PC and a corporation and everything together. It all comes back to who's the dude that gets the money, and that goes straight to the government. Hmm. Instead. Well, that's not good. But I would say that one thing it doesn't sound like it's going to do is actually penetrate the the the, the limited liability. And as now everybody knows that I'm the real owner. Okay, too bad. I mean, if that's true, but I don't think the act because it would really be pointless. I mean, if the act also got rid of the limited liability, then no one will bother making corporations or LLCs or anything anymore. I think now, in other words, it could be known, but you're still got the protection that says that's a, that it's the entity that's liable, not you personally. One would think, I don't know, I'll look into it. It sounds bad, but, uh, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll talk next year sometime about it yeah, okay, when exactly. I find out more. 
I have a uh, question. Um, we often hear people say piercing the corporate veil. Yeah. Um, what kind of uh, proper documentation we should have for LLC? Well, that's what I was alluding to okay. when the gentleman here brought up his question. Um, there are circumstances. If you, it's not that there's more paperwork that would help per se. Piercing the corporate veil is the lawyer's way of saying it's like the legal doctrine, whether it's a lawyer or a judge who's trained legally. That phrase triggers in the mind of a lawyer, okay, there are circumstances where something so egregious is being done in the name of the co company that it's like wrongful or against public policy or some such phrase that the person should be allowed to do that and still get the protection of a limited liability. So really what it comes down to is if you did something very illegal or very egregiously vi violating other people's rights, there can be circumstances that they would be able to pierce the corporate veil. The other well-known like no-no that leads to that is the person who uses the limit, whether it's a corporation or a limited liability company or any other entity, if you start using it like your own piggy bank, then that's you're you're definitely destroying that. I mean, that's the by far. If I want to attack the other sides, like I want to pierce the corporate veil, the best thing I can find is the day they pay their loan, they pay all their bills using money out of the LLC bank account. They uh, they take trips and they have a business credit card, but they put everything on there. They you know their net Netflix and Amazon and everything's on the business credit card. Well, at a certain point. That means that you're treating it as your own back pocket. So that a lawyer can very easily argue that, okay, it's just an alter ego for you, it's really you. And they'll that'll be a successful argument in court if you if you just use it as your own piggy bank. So that's the single biggest most frequent mistake. Um, don't do that. Don't buy, you know, why have, don't have the LLC if you're going to do that because there's kind of no point. Do not, do not pay your personal bills out of the LLC. Pay yourself, take a, take an owner draw and use that money. Yeah, and that's taxable income. By the way, the good news about that is it's taxable at ordinary income tax rates, but it's, but there's no employment tax on that money. And so, and there's no FICA. So, Yes, you'll pay. You should you you should report it, and it's ordinary income to you. But don't, yeah, you know, take the money and then pay your bills with it. But don't don't pay the bills directly with either credit cards or checks in the name of the LLC. Make sure those are just business expenses. So is there something you regularly see or rarely see? Well, because it's the big thing that people are afraid of, and I mean that because it kind of wipes out the point of the LLC. I mean, it's usually because someone's being sued or about to be sued, and that's what they're afraid of. Oh, it's real. Is it frequent? I would have a hard time giving you like some kind of statistic, but it you can count on the other side if you've done something. I mean, you can count on the other side's lawyer to try. What well, they're going to try. Because what do they know up front? They don't know anything up front. They're going to do what's called discovery, make you give, they can make you turn records over and stuff like that. And eventually, if it becomes clear that that's what you've been doing, then they're going to go for that. They're going to go. And the, again, the most frequent problem that leads to a court actually agreeing with, with the one side that wants to pierce the corporate veil of the other is because they treated it as their extension of themselves. Only rarely, it's very rare. The other example I gave is extremely rare. It's very rare that you see it because the company or the corporation did something illegal. I, that's true, that could lead to it, but that in practice doesn't happen so much. But what does happen is people just they kind of ignored it themselves. They were treating it as just a cash, a cash funnel for their own, for their own expenses. And you don't want to play that game. No, because then you're destroying the point. And yes, that does happen.
So I don't want to go, Lloyd, do I have time for more? Am I, am I running too late here? Uh, oh, no, no, you have plenty of time. Oh, okay. Hands got something. Yes, this might be an outlandish question, but do you- uh, Ridiculous, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that eventually um, AI is going to take over and we're going to, um, if, it will, if they will be able to, I guess, you know, tap into anything, we won't not have any protection at all. How do you I don't know. That? I mean, AI is likely to make my job sort of more gradually, make it more and more obsolete because people will write their own briefs and, right. you know, based on precedent, the AI can reach, read every brief that ever was written and then, on the same subject and then put together a composite. But I mean, will it, I don't know that AI alone, it's AI combined with whatever Amanda said. It's not AI as such, it's AI combined with some stupid act like the, what she just told us about. That, the combination, is, it sounds deadly. Because if the law is it's going to be that you've got to reveal all that, I don't even understand that law. Because where are you going to where are you going to reveal all that? You're going to walk around with, you know, have airplanes in the sky with banners. I mean, what does it mean you're going to reveal all that? I I, I mean, we don't need to go there. We, I can find out and give a talk on it, you know, in, in February or January or March, but and figure out what it really does mean. But it just sounds it sounds kind of crazy, and so I'll have to see. A lot of things, all, all I know is that in my career as a lawyer, a lot of things where people said the sky is falling, the sky is falling, it turns out after a while that there's ways around it or there's ways to deal with it. Uh, one good example was in Florida, they started impounding LLC. I say, I say that this is too complicated probably for this talk, but they, I'll, I'll touch on it for, for this reason. It was like this terrible, terrible thing that you could get a charging order and then you could actually charge the LLC for something they're suing you for. So it sounds like you're losing, you're losing the protection. Oh my God, the LLCs are useless now. That wasn't, it's not how it's played out. There is the problem that if you are a sole owner of an LLC and someone is your creditor, they can't go into the LLC as such. That's the, what people didn't realize. It didn't change that. But in some states like Florida, it did, courts would say, well, what do you, you know, what assets do you own that could satisfy this judgment? There's a judgment against you, let's say personally, for something. Well, the LLC has a value. They can't look inside the LLC. They can't, at least they couldn't until that happened, maybe. They can't attack it by, by piercing it, but they can just say, hand it over. It's an asset, you own it. You owe me a lot of money. I'll accept your LLC, full payment for those debts. Thank you very much. Well, if that LLC owns a bunch of stuff, that's where it could get a little tricky. Now, not all states will let that happen. So that's a little complicated. It's not easy to do that as the plaintiff, but that's, it's, that's what a charging order could lead to. It's very rare. Um, and I don't think in, it doesn't work in Missouri, but it might work in Florida because there was this very controversial case. But it hasn't played out that way. In other words, people still use LLCs in Florida and it basically works. Um, the other answer is as soon as there's more than one member, and that's another thing, what people started doing in Florida is, okay, I'm going to give a 5% interest to my cousin. And now you've, you've killed it because it's not just you, you, it's not yours to hand over anymore. Oh, there's another owner. So now it's not there for your debts. You can't hand it over because, oh, there's other people. So the simplest, people were doing that a lot as a simple way to solve that problem. But I've never seen it. You can't even, it's not, it's, it's not available as a remedy in Missouri anyway. But that's an example of the sky is falling. Everyone thought LLCs are going to be useless now. And it wasn't that hard to fix. So I don't know. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying is we'll adapt as things get go crazy as best we can, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, you can go, go, I know a, in Catron County, New, is it New Mexico? Yeah, Catron County, New Mexico, which is bigger than some states, runs the whole west side of New Mexico. 
there's people there's prep there's people there who live there's a couple little towns but you go deep into the hills there and there's people who live in the entrance of what looks like just a cave but when you go in there it's very fancy and very plush and they've got enough supplies to last for 30 years stored away so you can do that right and uh, go off the grid you know i mean these things exist and some people were that worried so uh, what can i say anything else should i advance to um the next thing i think so so jim says yes so i the next three slides I, I'm going to quickly show them to you and then I'm going to go back and I'm not going to go into so much detail as it seems here because I think you're all familiar with, first of all, you understand that property transfers by deeds, right? And I'm bringing up deeds because they play into the structure. They play into how you're taking title by a deed it has an interplay with where well, are you taking title as an individual? Are you taking title as an LLC, are you taking it as a corporation or what? What? Who is deeding it and who is receiving it? Who is deeding it out, let's call it? That's deed. When I say deeding it, that's usually the person selling it or deeding it to the other person, but that's how we, that's how we talk, right? But sometimes it's not clear, like the word rent, I hate as a lawyer, you know. I have, you know, rental, it's a rental, but are you the tenant or the landlord, you know? <laughs> okay. Oh, here. So the three, three slides are three types of deeds, right? You've probably heard of them all. Um, the tricky part about understanding deeds is the easiest deed is the quick claim deed. Now that's actually, I had that as the third of three slides, but I'm thinking now I should start with that one. First of all, I can teach you all a quick lesson because Half the world calls them quick, thinks they're quick claim deeds. Just do me one of them quick claim deeds, right? It's not a quick claim deed. Quick, in kind of older English, means essentially think of it as relinquish. To quit your interest in something was to relinquish your interest in it. It's similar to the way we use quit in ordinary talking, similar but not the same. Now you quit means you quit playing, which means you you no longer have an interest in that game. So jumping on me. I don't know what I'm doing. All right. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. So oh, yeah, let's go. So quit claim deed is that's your. But see that what's nice about a quit claim deed is all you're doing is relinquishing whatever interest you have in X Y Z property. What if you don't have any interest in that property? You've not done anything illegal. Keeps doing it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, okay. You've not done anything illegal by giving, I can give you a quick claim to, you know, the famous example to the Brooklyn Bridge. Have I done anything wrong? No, you have, now you have whatever interest I ever had in the Brooklyn Bridge, which is nothing, but there's nothing okay that's the truth you don't have anything but i didn't do anything wrong by quit claiming it to you just i don't i don't have any interest in that what it does do though is if you do have an interest if i do own a piece of property and i quit claim it to you then i am conveying it to you it does work it is a deed so it is a deed that will transfer property what it doesn't do is it doesn't guarantee you about what the status of my interest really is. So if it turns out that I told you that, it, that, it, that you'll own this property, but it turns out I don't have an interest in that property, there was no, there was no guarantee in the quit claim deed that says I did. So you really can't win on a suit back on somebody who quit claimed you the property because they didn't make any warranty of title. They didn't say that they, they didn't literally by the fact of the deed tell you that we yeah we own this again they're really just saying if i own it now you own it right so that can be a problem what if i don't own it now but i do own it i'm, I'm negotiating to buy it well that's not that's not a crime in itself i can sell you something if i'm honest about it that i'm still negotiating to buy i can sell it to you today as long as you know that 
I'm not committing a fraud. A quick claim deed, though, you shouldn't, if you're, if you're the one accepting that, you shouldn't do that with a quick claim deed because now if I get title after I quick claim it to you, you don't get automatic, you don't automatically get the title. Now that's the difference. Let's go back now. The general warranty deed, which is what you see, you know, when one homeowner transfers to another in a vanilla flavored residential real estate home, you know, home transaction where one homeowner has lived in the house for 20 years and is now move, moving to get a better, take a better job in, in Georgia. So there they go. And now they're selling you their house. They'll do it by general warranty deed, which is a guarantee that they did have title. So the same, so in my scenario, in my scenario, then a general warranty deed would work if I said, well, you know, I'm still negotiating about this. If you'll buy, I still want to enter into a contract with you to sell it to you. That's actually okay. If I do get title, now you have, it. I don't, it automatically goes to you if I gave you a warranty deed. Um, Special warranty deed in general are basically the same for the purposes of our purposes as investors. The special, if you ever do want to give guarantees of title, though, don't do the general. Do the special. If you're the one conveying, if you're the one selling, do this. If you're going to, if you want to give some kind of guarantee, do the special, not the general. Why? Because the special only says that nobody has superior title to me. I, I, no, that's not. What, that's not the point. How do I say it better? A special warranty deed only says that while I owned it, I didn't put any other liens on it or let any other liens get on it. So I, as far as my activity with this property, there's, it's a clean title, but I don't know anything about the ancient history of this property. I'm not guaranteeing that there's not some very old lien of some sort that was, that I was subject to and now you are. If I only give you a special warranty deed, it only is a guarantee that I don't owe other people money and I didn't pledge this property as collateral or I didn't do other things that, that it, the word that lawyers use and most of you've heard it is encumber the title. That means let a lien be put on it, pledge it as collateral and so on. So, so it's special warranty deed says I didn't do that, but it doesn't guarantee the chain of title going back forever. So the strongest one is, is, is the general. So receiving the one, if you could possibly get someone to give you a general warranty deed, that's the best one to receive. To give, of course, quick claim is the least, the one that is the least, you know, causes the least potential problems for you. So, um, but the point is, if you're LL, if again, <clears throat> as a general giving a special warranty deed as an LLC is safer, right? Than giving it. And that's why I think the two topics kind of mix at this point is if you're, you could maybe give a special warranty deed as a, because your LLC owned it and you know, your LLC is clean. That way you don't get your own name involved in it though. It's only your LLC that's saying, yeah, the LLC did not put any extra liens on there. So you see the LLC combined with the right deed can tell you is, is a useful tool. And that's kind of why I put it in here. I mean, there's plenty else to say about deeds, but, um, but that's see what I said, warrants defects during time of ownership or no further encumbrances during grantor's possession. That's what I'm saying. So that's the special versus the general. But again, a quick claim makes no guarantees about the title. And yet it does convey the real estate if it's true that I do own it. It is effective. It just doesn't have any guarantees. I want to mention other types of deeds just to teach because you're all investors um, or, want, or looking to be. Um, there are some interesting other types of deeds that you should, again, as a lawyer, I just sort of want to put that as a real estate lawyer, I do a lot of these different things. Um, so this is a little bit of a side point, but a beneficiary deed, remember I said that your LLC can be a habit sort of, can have a transfer on death provision. Is there an equivalent for real estate? 
we, we can put TOD right on the car title. We can put TOD on our, most times on a bank account, right? Transfer on death. So no probate, right? It goes straight to the person. You all you come into the bank with a death certificate now, it says transfer on death, that's it, you're done. Same with the title of a car. A beneficiary deed can do the same thing for a piece of real estate. So you don't have to worry about a will or putting it in trust for the you just do a beneficiary deed for whoever you want to receive the property on your death, and it's really simple. You just file the affidavit of death and the beneficiary deed is already on file and now it's your property and you didn't go through probate or anything. You also get the stepped up basis on death and I will explain that to anyone who asks me afterward, but you, it, you, it works just as good as getting it in a will or in a trust. Go ahead. So then, uh, what does it cost? What does it cost a uh, rough estimate to set up a beneficiary deed? Oh, I do them for, what about 150 wow. and then and then you find you know, a filing fee in the real i mean you need to pay another 50 bucks maybe maybe 40 50 bucks to file it oh okay so 200 ish altogether yeah they're not i say that if you've got some weird real estate or you're doing that on 10 different pieces of property that i have to put the legal descriptions in, it could cost more if it takes me more time but a basic one for one property that's a simple, straightforward beneficiary, you need one beneficiary, I'd say I'd stick to that. Just one point. house, it's just one house. One house and one one recipient. Or well, two recipients, but. Are they married? No, brother and sister. Okay. Yeah. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later yeah. about it. Okay, yeah, two recipients, we doubled it, 300, right? Okay. <laughs> um, no, it's it's a good it's a good it's a good instrument. Because, oh, important though for your recipients to understand something, since you did ask an extra question about it. This is your bonus for, for asking a question. Beneficiary deed does. Let's say let's take your example. You do it, and it's for your it's for uh, who? Oh, oh, your mom might do it to you and your sister. All right, let's say. All right, for example. Don't get confused about one thing. It doesn't, even though it's sitting there in the record now, it's filed for record in the reporter of deeds office. It does not prevent her from selling it. It only means that if she still owns it when she dies, then you get it. But if she sells it, it doesn't. You have you and your sister have no ability to claim across and stop that sale or later do anything about it. She by selling it, she effectively canceled that beneficiary. And you, the recipients, can't stop that from happening. So just know that that's true. It works, but doesn't stop the person who did the beneficiary deed from deciding, oh, you know what, I'm going to sell it instead. But that's a good, there's a good side to that, which is it means the person is less afraid to, to put one on their house because, okay, I, if I do die, I want my kids to have it, but if I'm going to retire, and need to send, go to move to Florida and sell it, it's not going to get in the way. Yeah, so it's it's useful. Um, there are deeds by trustees from the trust. That's the obvious that there should such, be such thing. Don't confuse that, though, with a trustee under foreclosure. A trustee's deed under foreclosure is the title you'll see on a deed when there's been a for actual foreclosure. And the the trustee is the person who had the power under the deed of trust to sell the property to pay the debt. So that's a whole bank, it's the world of banking, right? And, and liability. So there's nothing, it's just something to know. It's called a trustee's, actually a trustee's deed under foreclosure it means it was just foreclosed on. That's what that, so if you're, if you're getting the property that way, it means you bought it out of foreclosure. And that's what the deed would say. Um, personal representative can, can, can sign a deed that's if you go to that's if you do go to probate, someone gets appointed personal representative because the person didn't have a will and they didn't do anything else and you're one of the heirs at law. Well, there'll be a personal representative that has to sign that deed or a conservatorship. Again, that's if somebody's incapacitated and they go to court. Someone else, a relative, goes to court and says they can't handle their own affairs. Please appoint me conservator. Then the conservator could sign a deed um, about for that person. But that's also could be valid if it was if the conservatorship was done right. And then a sheriff's deed, that's when they sell your property for debts. 
again, I won't go into, there's a million situations that could lead to that, but there could be sheriff's deeds. Um, so those are a bunch of different types of deeds. Um, okay, special topics. Oh, was the deed part, anyone, I think that was, anyone have any questions on deeds? Because I sort of, now I'm kind of done with that. The last one, the sheriff's uh, deed. Mm -hmm. Oops. Yeah. Is that generally issued after you buy the house from a tax sale? Is that the type of deed or? Yeah, I guess that is another type of sheriff's deed. Yeah, that's not, that wasn't what I was thinking of, but those are generally, those are generally sheriff's deeds too, that you have to quiet title to turn into insurable title. So there's a whole story there. I just, okay. It's another talk. But yes, after a after you purchase a the tax lien at a tax lien sale, um, what you'll get is a sheriff's deed. There's nothing wrong with the sheriff's deed, but title companies won't insure them unless you've also done what's called a suit to quiet title. Another whole talk, um, but that's um, that's what that yes, it happens to be a sheriff's deed also. I, I, one thing that people don't know. Yeah, question. Rather than a general, right. yeah. You could, if you're comfortable. You, yeah, if you know, if you're comfortable that your title search was a good, which you should be, right? And you've got good title through a title company, and you, there is nothing in the history that you to be worried about. Then yeah, then that would be a reason why you could probably convey by a general warranty deed because you know there's nothing going to nothing there and you have a title policy to back you up if it turns out to be wrong for some who knows why the title company's on the hook now they're giving you title insurance that is the point yes yeah oh yeah yeah but it has a value if you don't finish quieting the title you still own the thing but um, you know, we should talk because I know you need a you need a, a title finished. And I'm aware of it, but um, there's a yeah. I mean, you need to quiet the title in order to in order. It's not really that you need to. In other words, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you have a sheriff's deed. But to be comfortable for anyone to be comfortable buying it from you is when that will come up. There's nothing wrong with waiting a bit until the sheriff's. But again, the point is going to be to sell it, right? Fix it up and sell it. Yeah, you need to have quiet the title. What? Well, you mean to try to refi it? Yeah, the, well, a bank will probably hesitate also again until you quiet the title, right? I re yeah, I realize. So he's aware of a property that we need to finish getting done. So. Um, that's yes, we need that need to finish it so you can either refi or sell. Yeah, understood. Um, but that's the, the sheriff's deed can also one thing that a lot of people don't know that I've run into more than you asked about the frequency of certain strange things like piercing. A thing that people don't know until they until they find out the wrong way is that your homeowners association is usually given is given by law very strong powers. You can kind of understand the origin of it, right? Because they don't really have a lot of money, right? They usually the HOA fees are not a big. I mean, they might be several hundred dollars a year, but they're not huge money. I think that's the origin of it. I don't really know why, but that's my guess. So they're given some strong extra powers that the average association you you wouldn't think they would have. One thing they have is the power if you get behind in your HOA fees. I mean, they wouldn't do this, you would hope, if it's just one year you're missing or two. But I've seen situations where someone hasn't paid their HOA fees in five years or more. They have the power to, to foreclose on your property. So let's say you're talking a $500 a year HOA fee. So after 10 years, you only owe, you owe $5,000. They can, for and your house is worth $300,000, let us say. 
They can foreclose on your property, sell it on the courthouse steps, give, take the 5000 that's theirs and give you the balance, which won't be $300,000 on the courthouse steps. So, and that would be a sheriff's deed, because that sheriff is who, when they, when they do that, that's who's selling it. It's a sheriff's execution. That's a, no. That's a, that'll be a general execute. That'll be an execution by a sheriff. That that's what they'll, they'll go to court and they'll get the right to do that. So don't, don't ignore your HOA fees, okay? They have an extra superpower to get their money back. I actually have had to fish people out of that fire a couple of times. Yes, so people don't know. Um, so see, I do all kinds of things as a real estate lawyer that you probably never thought of. <laughs> um, wait, here. Uh -huh. So we've covered the privacy thing pretty well. And I also covered the probe. This is more, these are reminders to me more or less. And the probate inheritance, again, is just the point that people don't realize you can put something in the operating agreement that makes the LLC transfer on debt. Um, oh, yeah, tenant relations was just that almost, uh, I was being a little humorous, right? But that, what I meant by that was like, again, oh, I'm just the manager, you know, what do I know? I'll have to talk to the owners about getting that, that, that wash machine replaced, you know, or something. So it, 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 it puts a layer of separation between you. If you, it is, I mean, I think it's true to some extent, right? If you really own it personally in your name, there's no hiding that it, you're, you're the landlord, right? But if it's an LLC that owns it, and I'm the manager of the LLC. Even if you don't make a big deal about it, it just puts a slightly different feel on, under the, on, the whole, on the whole thing. Now, LLCs and evictions is the last serious topic I wanted to get into. I'm not going to read you this. These are more in a way for me, but to remind me what to tell you, because I don't expect you to be able to read all that from the, from out there. But let's just say there are two main types of lawsuit, and those of you, and anyone here ever, anyone here, who are the landlords here who've had to evict people? Okay, a lot of a number of you. And every, are you aware that there's two, two basic types of suit, lawsuit, and why that is, is, and there really is a third one that I, that's also, I'm going to mention them, but there's two main types. Do you know what they're called? Who, who here knows what they're both called? Correct. So when does rent and possession apply versus why would you, so why would you pick one over the other? When does rent and possession apply? Well, yeah, but that could also be unlawful detainer under some circumstance. Well, no, but why would you pick rent possession over unlawful detainer? I couldn't quite hear you. Well, you can get the oh, but either either type of suit, you get both. So the trick is, if there's a if there's a lease that's still in force. And you're, and you're not out past the end of the lease either, then it's rent and possession. And rent and possession tends to be a little quicker. If it's, if you, if, if, if the person is not, you got a lease, or they had a lease, but you let them stay and become a month to month tenant, you let them stay past the end of, let's say you had a one year lease, but now they're there past one year and you never renewed the lease. Um, now they are, a month-to-month -month tenant by law. There are certain rules that apply to a month-to-month -month tenant who doesn't have a lease. There are certain specifics, like how much notice you have to give them if now you want them out, right? Because there's no, there's no lease, right? So you should be able to get them out, right? But there's rules about how much notice you have to give them. Um, So the, 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 tr the trick that I want you to take away from all this is that you have to make an unlawful detainer. So that's if you've got a month a month or, and this is another thing, if it's after a foreclosure, right? Is that what it, to say that clearly, 
Should, or is that, wait a minute. I thought I underlined it. Right, it is, that's what that says. Second bullet point is, it's, it's still, it's an unlawful detainer case after a foreclosure, but it's not an unlawful detainer case after a tax lien purchase, which is a lot like a foreclosure. But when you buy the tax lien, it's a more complicated kind of lawsuit to get them out. It's not, un, it's not rent possession or unlawful detainer. So the tax lien is a pain in that regard. If you want to try to evict them, it can be done. But there's a third type of suit called ejectment, and it is not on a fast track. Unlawful detainer and rent possession are supposedly, at least, on a faster track in, in, in Missouri courts. And that works, of course, with a tenant and also under rent possession and also on, on with unlawful detainer after either they're they're like they're like a month to month tenant there's no lease anymore or even after an ordinary foreclosure i'm talking about like a foreclosure because they didn't pay their they didn't let us like when the bank forecloses after a tax lien sale it's even a slower case and it's called it's called um ejectment that's like if you're trying to eject a squatter they just showed up somehow on your property that's a whole nother deal and it's even a little takes a little longer which seems strange, right? The person who had no right to be there is harder to get out than the person who actually came there with a lease had a right to be there in the beginning. You would think that would be the other way around, right? But go figure. I can't even explain that as a lawyer. But um, it noticed what, here's the part I want you to, and I know there's other lawyers that people use in this room and they're, they're good lawyers. For especially, I'm not, by the way, I don't do tons of evictions like some lawyers you guys probably know the names of, which I won't, I do, won't do them any free advertising. But you got, there's, they're good lawyers, but sometimes um, people aren't aware of this. You must give notice first. And I have actually, sometimes tenants will come to me. I mostly represent landlords, but if a tenant has a, an, an honest case, I'm not going to, I don't refuse it in principle. I mean, it just doesn't happen a lot. They, they don't want to spend the money, and so forth. Oops. There it is. But <clears throat> if you don't give that notice, I have actually, well, that didn't work. They just escaped. Did more than get rid of that mic patch. And then, you know, let's try it again. But the point is, you have to give that notice. And that notice, um, if you don't do it and, you, and, I'm, and I'm representing the tenant, I can get the whole case thrown out. You got to start over. So that's, that's, uh, that notice is important and there's and after foreclosure there's specific wording in the statute of what that notice has to say it has to be done right and it has to be served and posted you have to get a private process server sometimes to serve it there's without worrying about which is which and which detail goes with which kind of suit but it, it, that notice hangs people up and a lot of people are sloppy and they don't do it and of course most tenants don't hire a lawyer especially a lawyer who knows what they're doing so a lot of times they get away with it. I mean, I understand that. If you get away, if the tenant doesn't know to raise that issue, hey, I never got a notice, and that that's a really actually important issue, they don't mention it and whatever, right? Or they didn't get proper notice. So, um, so that's what actually that's what that was about there. The notice required, um, and. I like this example. I, I, I took, I have a, actually an attorney working for me who does the majority of our evictions. And I took a letter that he wrote and then I just changed the names to neutral names, right? So I figured this would be cute. It's, it's from the Pitbull Law Firm. And the lawyer's name is Fear, Fearsome, Pit, Fearsome Pitbull. And he, he's writing to the, notice though, he's writing to the tenant, right? Right. 
Surprise me, but not really. But don't do this. If you take one thing away, if you have to, if you are a landlord here and you need to evict, do not when you when you're writing the letter that says you need to get out and you don't want to hire the lawyer yet. I get that. Don't spend money on the lawyer. But here's one thing: that please don't do this. Do not say you do say, do say okay. You haven't paid the rent in two months, three months, whatever. Please be out by the end of this month, or pick another date. Whatever you're, you're, you're in breach of your lease. Do not say I am terminating your lease. I see it all the time because they. It sort of sounds logical, right? Like I'm terminating your lease. That should terminate your right to be there, right? No. What terminated their right to be there is that they're in breach of the lease. They didn't pay the rent, which is required by the lease, or they did something bad. By the way, you can also evict people for other breaches of the lease, right? Like you can put in there that they're disturbing the neighborhood, and that can be a, a requirement in your lease. And if they're doing that, that's another breach of the lease. Don't terminate the lease because the lease has things in it that you want, such as what's the biggest one? The lease will most likely say that in the event the landlord has to sue you to get you out, the landlord not only gets the rent but is entitled to his, her, or its attorney's fees. If you terminate the lease, you just terminated the thing that would have given you attorney's fees. So you'll still win, most likely, right? I mean, because you're right, they didn't pay you and they're in breach, you know. But now you can ask for attorney's fees and the judge says, well, you terminated the lease. So if you don't have a lease that says you get attorney's fees, you don't get them. So don't terminate the lease if there is one. Now, if it's unlawful detainer and there's no lease, it's a different problem, right? But don't terminate the lease. And unlawful detainer, please send the correct notice, you know, because um, the, the statute for unlawful detainer has exact wording for how you have to word that notice. And you must send the notice first. And I think there's a certain number of days ahead of time. Yeah, that's the other thing. Unlawful detainer has like something like 10 days. Rent and possession, that's another thing. It's better why it's better. Because you rent and possession, you have to give notice, but there's nothing prescribed about. In other words, you could give the notice and the next morning you could go file the lawsuit to evict them. You just have to say in the lawsuit that you did give notice. It doesn't say how long ago you gave notice. The unlawful detainer statute, I think, says 10 days. Anyway, it has a definite period that you have to wait. And then you can bring the lawsuit. Um, <clears throat> why did I put this in here? No, there's a there was a good reason. I'm forgetting it. Oh, of course. This is the other big takeaway for today. And now, what's what, what's probably the only bad bad. I think, in my view, this is the only bad thing in a way about an LLC, but it would be equally true about a corporation or any other, a trust, anything else like that. What's the one bad thing in a certain way that I'm thinking about here when I put this slide up here? Anyone know what I'm getting at? Can you read it? I don't know if you can read it. You cannot personally represent the LLC in court. You cannot file the the case in court. If you are, it's true that if you own it in your own name, you can go to court and you can file that eviction and there's nothing wrong with that. That's the one I have to admit, it's a bona fide, genuine like advantage, if you will. To me, it's not worth, you know, all the, all the other negatives, but it is an advantage that you can sue on your own if you own it in your own name. 
Do you, you own it in the name of an LLC or I don't care, or an LLC or any other entity, any other thing other than in your own name? You cannot represent that ent that entity. It used to, it always, not only that, but what, you're committing a crime. It's called, see, misdemeanor in black. It's actually a misdemeanor, it's, it's, so it's a low level crime, but it's technically a crime to file something on behalf of your LLC when you're not a lawyer. That used to be clever lawyers for a long time used to argue, well, your honor, it's a misdemeanor, but that's for the prosecutor to, to do something about. But meanwhile, you know, my client here, yeah, he filed the suit on his own. We know he shouldn't have done that, but now he's got a lawyer and he's not going to go forward on his own. And we understand. So that should, that should take care of it, shouldn't it? That's, you bring the lawyer in later. Well, that was done. That used to be done a lot. No, in court. Court is the key. Only court. Filing in court or appearing in court. But now you can do. You can change the lease and draft stuff. Yeah. No, not required to be a lawyer. No. But if in court you can't file on behalf of it and you can't. Um, show up in court and, and argue in behalf of it. And here's the new, relatively new thing in the sense that there was a case only about three or four years ago that clarified this point. And once there's a case, as I mentioned way in the beginning, precedent is a big part of the law. The case said, yeah, it's very nice that you, Mr. Wallach, let's say I'm trying to argue that. Yeah, my, my client should not have started this suit on his own, but here I am, you're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a misdemeanor, but my argument before that case would have been, yeah, so the statute says it's a misdemeanor. So that's what the legislature intended. They intended the sanction is that it's a misdemeanor. You should, someone should tell the prosecutor and go ahead and whatever they're going to do. But when the statute says that, that means it doesn't, it could have said, well, also everything you do on behalf of the LLC doesn't count, but it doesn't say that. Well, there's a case that basically, again, without going into all the details of how they got there, now it's very clear that not only is it a misdemeanor, but that's rarely, I've never seen it, anyone actually prosecuted ever for that. And I doubt they will be. Because the other sanction is much more important and much more damaging. Everything you did on behalf of the company in the courtroom from the filing of the suit forward is wiped out. It's a nullity, like it didn't happen. That means that, that you've got to start all over with the lawyer, with a new lawsuit and a new everything. And if that, if there's other things going on where time is of the essence, you're losing a lot of time, right? Starting all over. And I can tell stories about where, where would time be really super critically of the essence is again, there's complicated situations, but um, let's just say if there's any degree bona fide real disputes about title, you want the unlawful detainer to go quick if your title is being challenged in another courtroom. But if you just, if that just happened to you, because you went ahead and thought you were going to be clever and filed a lawsuit on your own, you just, it's like, do not pass go, do not collect 200. You're going right back to the beginning and you're starting all over. So you've lost a lot of time and the whatever money. But that is, um, that is now, the, that's why it's on, so it's unauthorized practice of law to file the lawsuit or to go to court on behalf of your LLC or any other, for that matter, for a corporation or for a partnership or any other entity other than yourself personally. For yourself personally, it's totally allowed. Um, so, okay, do we want to take, uh, I think that's, yeah, last uh, question. No, that's it. That's, that okay. was my final point that I wanted to leave people with. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody, any last questions? I'm sure, Roger, you want to stick around? We're getting, I don't mind just, we got to room yeah, for another half an hour. To right, I don't mind staying around and answering Is individual any, questions if that's, okay. if that's better. But anyway, I hope all that was of some interest and use to people here. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. Yeah. We appreciate you coming out tonight. And my, although I'm happy to give you a card, but my, Contact info is on Contact there. information. Okay, and you've got cards with you? Yeah, sure, I do. Okay, sure, okay. I do. Yeah. okay. okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, that'll do it for tonight. And um, just a few uh, 
Morning comments. Uh, a lot of us are landlords and we like to know how our, our tenants, when they leave, we like them to take all their trash with them. And right now, tonight, we are tenants in this room. So our landlords would like us to clear our tables, throw our trash in the trash cans nearby. There's a couple of trash cans around. Appreciate it all. And uh, just remember, see you next week, next month at, uh, but we're not in this room. We're going to be upstairs, take the elevator over on this side up to the third floor. We'll have that posted on our, our newsletter. And uh, thank you all for coming. See you next month.